Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the uh, Walkley Media Conference. Uh, my name is Peter Ryan, and I'm the ABC's business editor, and I'm delighted to be here today, particularly seeing the uh, fantastic lineup of speakers that we have today and have had over the last couple of days. Before we get, uh, get things underway this morning, uh, I've been asked to note a couple of housekeeping items for everyone to observe. Uh, tea breaks and lunch will be served throughout the day in the lounge area to the left of registration. You'll also find uh, the toilets in that area as well. The venue has asked that no food or drink be brought into the auditorium and uh, please keep your phones on silent and uh, uh, keep the twittering to a dull roar if that's possible. Um, so we have a great lineup of speakers and I'm sure that you'll be able to take away a lot of useful insights. Just before we started this morning we were talking about uh, feats of technology and uh, getting vision and sound back from rem remote locations. We'll be having a pretty good demonstration of that this morning. I'm told that one of our key speakers, Jay Rosen, is stranded in New Caledonia and will be coming to us uh, courtesy of the miracles of Skype. So it. Uh, It'll be a hats off to the Walkley's uh, IT team for getting that together. So I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Chris Barth to moderate uh, today's first session. Uh, you'll all know Chris, so uh, she's a veteran of the TV news scene and of course uh, the anchor of Seven's top rating 6pm news on weeknights in Sydney. So Chris, uh, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me here today. Um, before I introduce the man you're about to meet, I just want to put him in perspective for you from an Australian point of view. My boss, Peter Meakin, has been in the media business for 50 years. Uh, he looks a lot younger than that, I have to say that, because he's my boss, but he has been in the industry for 50 years. And his love of language and books on the subject pretty much rivals Imelda Marcos's love of shoes. And so it's fairly significant that he's pretty much the president of the fan club and chief cheerleader for the bloke that you're about to meet. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you a man who's been in more motel rooms than the Gideon Bible. Now, what he was doing there wasn't at all biblical. Uh, put simply, Bob Dotson, I'm just going to have to move this mic, that's a lot better for short people. Put simply, um, Bob Dotson is a storyteller. Now, for more than three decades, he's roamed the United States telling the stories of people who are practically invisible. The people who do make a difference, but don't send out press releases. Uh, his reports, American Story with Bob Dotson, are a treasured jewel of NBC's Today Show. Uh, he's one of the best in the business of broadcast journalism. He's the winner of more than 100 awards, including four Emmys. He's won the Edward R. Murrow Award for writing a record five times. His documentaries have received international acclaim. Uh, El Capitan's Courageous Climbers was the winner of seven international film and video festivals and was awarded the highest prize any documentary can get. So it's a pretty impressive CV and we can probably all benefit from it. As Mervyn Block said, we need more reporters with Bob's ability to tell stories. His book, Make It Memorable, is invaluable to any journalist who wants to strip away the jargon and muddled prose and write simply, clearly and with style. The pen is not always mightier than the sword, particularly in the hands of somebody who regularly murders the English language. Or as Oscar Wilde put it, the difference between literature and journalism is that journalism is unreadable and literature is not read. Bob Dotson can change all that. Please make him welcome. That was a lovely introduction. I should, call, I should call my mother. Nobody likes me like that except her, and she's lying. <laughs> she was a little concerned about my life's work. First time she saw what I did on television, I called her on the phone, and I said, did you see that story on the Today Show this morning? And she said, yes. And I said, well, what'd you think? It was a long pause. She says, I think you ought to learn a trade. They're not going to keep paying you for two minutes work a day. I said, Mom, I'm only on once a week. Oh, you're going to starve to death. <laughs> when I was young and newly minted as a journalist, I went to the CBS radio station in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, which is right smack dab in the middle of the country. And I said, I'm ready for a job. And they sent me to the zoo. So my first job 
was as the show announcer for the Elephant Show with a master's degree, Alice, Pumi, Trudy, Clara, and Marie. My mother was not impressed when I moved up to chimpanzees. Back in the day, Batman was big, and we had a little chimpanzee named Little Pierre, and we dressed him up in a Batman suit and put him out of the announce booth and out over the audience so that he could make a grand entrance. Unfortunately, there was a huge chimpanzee named Captain Bozo who kept looking at the wire. And Marlon Perkins, who was head of the, the zoo, said, Bob, here is a, a Nerf gun which shoots little pellets made out of sponge. It won't hurt Captain Bozo, but it'll keep him off that wire because if he drops into the kids, we're going to have big trouble. So about three months into it, the engineer and I were not paying any attention one afternoon because we kind of knew the routine a lot. And we kept screaming, you know, how about a big hand for him, boys and girls? And all of a sudden, we heard this gasp. And we looked out, and there was Captain Bozo about halfway up the wire looking like King Kong. Because I'd been shooting him all afternoon, you know. But I was hidden. My problem was I leaned out over the kids and shot him enough times that he dropped into the moat. And then all the kids applauded because he hopped out. Of course, it didn't hurt him. It was just his sponges. But the next day, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch said, zoo announcer shoots beloved chimp. So I lost my job. Fortunately, there were other people who said, well, why don't you uh, come and tell stories? If we were all in a car heading to a story and the right front tire went flat, your job would be to hop out, look at the right front tire, and start twittering, and then maybe do a story. But for 40 years, I've been able to not only Twitter, but to come back and kick all the other tires and say, why is this still up? And how long do you think this will go on? And that becomes very, very important. Because for all the talk we've had in the last 10 years about how we're going to deliver the news, it's a little like putting up the circus tent. The audience just assumes you're going to have a tent, but they didn't come to see the tent. They didn't come to see the Skype. They came to hear what that gentleman who's stuck on the runway has to tell you. And I think that that's something we need to do in order to um, refocus on storytelling. I look for significant people who don't send out press releases. Now, these folks may not run for prime minister, and they may not go to the moon. But I believe that if they are living an ordinary life with extraordinary passion, that they hold the blueprint on how we can solve our problems in the world today. So most of us are geared to look behind the media mirror that reflects celebrity and, uh, and power. But we don't look at the people in the shadows and interview them in depth. If we go out for those kinds of people, we do it like, uh, you know, like it's uh, just a feature story. But it all boils down to how we ask questions. Good writing begins on how we ask questions. And I've noticed in the last 40 years that people always answer questions three ways. They give you the answer they think you've asked for, and then they explain their answer. And if you wait just a beat before jumping in with your next question, they think, well, I really haven't explained it well enough. And they go, well, dummy, that's why I killed my wife. You got a sound bite. It's the rule of threes. Happens all the time. And if you watch a good murder mystery, the detectives say the person who speaks first in a room loses. It's the same way with journalism, with ordinary people. When I was a young reporter, I would go off to a, one time I was at a governor's press conference and I showed up late. And so I started joking with the governor. I said, will you stick around? You're running for reelection. And he said, sure. And I said, I'd like to ask you a question. He says, OK. So I turned my camera on, and I said, well, go ahead, Governor. Give me an answer. I was just joking with him. And he said, uh, what answer? And I said, didn't you just have a press conference? He said, yeah. I said, well, pick one out and give me 30 seconds. And you know he did. But ordinary people can't do that. They're, they're too, they're too um, wrapped up in, in what they're doing, but they're, but they're not, wrapped, they're not uh, attuned to how to deliver that. So if you ask the questions in threes and wait for the silence to build, you get a better answer. A lot of times you can also do this with what I call the non-question. If someone is smelling roses, you start talking about roses first, as opposed to saying, hi, I'm Bob Dotson with the Today Show, and immediately I'll start getting nervous. 
you just say, uh, those are lovely roses. I remember when the Shah of Iran was dying years ago, and his son was in a West Texas Air Force base, and everyone was staked out trying to get a, a sound bite from this kid, and, and he was uh, kept pretty close to, under wraps. We all went one afternoon to lunch and left uh, some uh, photojournalists there, and when I came back, the photojournalist Scotty Burner from NBC had the interview with the Shah of Iran's son. And he taught me the story about how to ask the non-question, because he said, I was sitting here, and I noticed that this young man was walking up the street, and he looked like he didn't grow up in Lubbock, Texas. So I figured, well, maybe he knows the Shah of Iran's son. So I walked over to him, and he was smelling roses. And I said, those are pretty roses. And he said, I had my camera on my shoulder, and it was on, so he knew who I was. But he started talking about roses. And then I said to him, you know, my dad loves roses. He used to run a flower shop, which was true. And the guy said, well, my dad uh, loves flowers, too. And then Scotty said, you know, my dad passed away last year. And the kid said, well, my dad is very sick. Sound bite, sound bite, sound bite, sound bite. About that time, he said, I really wasn't still sure that this was the Shah of Iran's son. But the security guards up in this house kind of looked up and went, oh, my dear boy, and they started running down. Now, Scotty didn't start arguing his First Amendment journalistic freedoms with guys who were carrying their Second Amendment freedoms. He started shooting the other pictures he needed to go with it. So he had the whole thing wrapped up, and by this time he knew that this was the Shah of Iran's son, and the other media had to interview Scotty because he had asked the non-question. He'd put the person you're trying to talk to at ease by talking to them about something they seem to be interested in already, and then gradually, without being hokey, move the conversation back to what he wanted to talk about, which was, in this case, his father was sick, and what does he think? So the rule of threes, the non-question question, and filling the silence. Now, why is that important? Well, if you start robbing some time during your day by being more efficient, you'll have more time to write and polish your story. When I sit down to write a story, I always write the middle first. I don't sit in angst about the opening line and wish I could write better. I go and I look at the three or four points that I would like to tell people, and by spading through all the information that I've gotten in my four minutes on location or whatever, I start to figure out what the story is. Now, as soon as I am assigned a story, I play the game of what if. If I had to stop right now, and tell this story, what's my closing line? Now, I don't care what the real words are, but what, what's my thought? What's, what's the best thing that I could, wh where am I going? Now, that will change all day long in journalism, and you should change while you, you know, as it happens. But the thing is, if you know where you're going, you don't have to get everything. You just have to get the elements that will lead you to your final shot. And if you're not shooting the pictures yourself, you ask two simple questions to the people who've shot it. What's your best picture? And what's the closing shot? And then you work with those elements. And it works time and again. So you write the, you write the, the middle of the story first. You have an idea where you're going, even though it may change. And then when you come to, to the point where now it's time to do your opening line, and you say, boy, I wish I were a better writer. Well, what I do is if you've been asking this non-question question and the rule of threes and silence and all that, you're probably going to have a couple of sound bites that you don't have time to jam into your story. So I pick one of the sound bites I didn't use and I paraphrase it as my opening line. Why? Because it already attracted me twice. A story begins with a lump in the throat. Something you feel compelled to tell. And if you haven't gotten to that point with your story, the audience doesn't care. So the best place to look is your emotional outline. The emotional outline begins with asking good questions, not just for the stuff that's going to end up in your story per se, but to get some sense of the emotion of what this story is about. Is it going to make your audience happy, sad, mad, frustrated, whatever? It has to have some emotion. The emotion becomes, comes from these, asking these questions. And so if you take that second sound bite and you paraphrase it, it's much more efficient and quick. 
Now, I know, all know, you know, a lot of us these days, we've climbed the ladder of success and we find it's been leaning against the wrong wall. We thought we were going to be writers and now we've got to take pictures. We thought we were going to take pictures, now we've got to be writers. We've got to be editors. We've got to be, you know, we're going to have all kinds of new things we didn't know about. I have a friend who is a uh, network photographer who was shooting a story with me the other day and I came to pick up what he had shot overnight at a, at a big concert. It was kind of a, you know, return to the 60s kind of hippie concert. And uh, he and I had had these long discussions about, you know, he doesn't want to have to learn how to write, and you know, why don't you learn how to take pictures? And he didn't know I have a master's in cinematography. I just don't do it all the time. But I, so I said, okay, what have you got? My usual question. What's, what's your best closing shot? What's your best opening shot? And he said, well, not much. Breakfast was either smoked or passed around in a bottle. I said, pardon me? He said, yeah, breakfast was either smoked or passed around in a bottle. People were taking hits off of marijuana and they were drinking all night. And I said, uh, you probably have pictures of that, don't you? And he said, yeah, actually there was one with the sun coming up and this guy is drinking out of it. You know, I said, I said Daryl, you, you, you're a terrific writer. And he said, what? I said, that's a great opening line. Breakfast is either smoked or passed around in a bottle. It's catchy. It supports the pictures you have. And it pretty much sums up what the story is. And it's intriguing. He said, hmm, I'll never be a writer. He says, but I might be a storyteller. And I said, well, that's about as far as you're going to get. Be a storyteller. Don't worry about whether last week you were an editor and this week you're a producer. Just be a storyteller, and you'll come back to content. Now, another way to really uh, be efficient in your writing is to remember a little short mantra that somebody passed on to me years ago. We've all heard of who, what, when, where, why. But this is more important for today's world. And it's, hey, get their attention. Hey, get their attention. Right now, get their attention. A murder mystery always has a dead body on page one, or it's not a very good murder mystery. The second part of it is you. Almost as important as the first, hey, is you have to link it to your audience immediately. It might be a train wreck in Calgary, but this is why you care in Sydney. You. And that's very often left out. C is the two or three things that you found out about the story that maybe the person standing next to you doesn't know. And it may just be interpretation because almost all information is out there instantly. So that's where the good storytelling comes. There's only two ways you can can be successful in the story. Either have information that nobody else has, which is almost impossible anymore, or tell it in such a way that no one cares because they just like the way you're telling the story. So that's the C part. Hey, you, C, and the last is so. So why should they care? If a group of kids off the coast of South Carolina has won a poetry contest and you're sent out to do one of those little grade B features, you got to ask yourself on the so, so why did this happen? Well, maybe it's because the mind is their closest friend. There's only four or five of them on the island. So once you find a theme, you can build to the theme. And if the theme is incorrect, you'll learn that early on in the way you're stacking your story. But every story has to have that hey, you, see, so. Even if it's a complicated and a not very visual story. Hey, you, see, so. I was assigned years ago a market basket story on the price of meat. The nightly news. 45 seconds, no more, no less. And everybody said, well, we've got some guy in a pinstripe suit that can talk to you. And we've got some graphics and this, that, and the other. And an assignment editor in Fort Worth said, you know, you network tools are dumb. He says, nobody cares about that kind of stuff. He says, you go out there to the butcher shop and you ask the butcher to show you how much meat you could buy for $5 five years ago. And then take yourself a great big old cleaver and say, this is how much you could buy for $5 today. Whack! Chink. So that's what I did. I got more letters on that story than anything I had done up to that point at NBC. Very simple. No graphics, but imagination. And it's straightforward, and it's something people can relate to. We all have gone out and bought meat. And it's, just, it's not a percentage of the index. It's $5 five years ago, $5 today, and this is what you've got. It's the hors d'oeuvre. So hey, 
U, C, so. Even in the most complicated stories, I ask myself, because almost always you go out nowadays, right, and they, and they put you into um, uh, a situation where everybody that you're, de you're dealing with is trying to spin the story. So you say to yourself, well, where am I in the process of this story? Am I at the hey? Am I at the you? The C? And the so? Doesn't make any difference whether you've got a five minute window like I have on the Today Show or you're writing a Twitter. I mean, most things that pass for Twitter today are I'm going to the mall to buy a green sweater. And yet, we've been writing Twitter since the beginning of time. We call it poetry or country western lyrics. Instead of I'm going to go buy a green sweater so that Bill will like me, how about honey, the gutter ain't a step up from you? One is a story. The other is an observation. And what's going to separate us as professionals from all the amateurs? Well, we're storytellers. People in this world have a lot of information at their fingertips, but they don't have time. And so they still want somebody to wade through all of this and come up with something better. So a lot of it comes when you're using these tools and you go out and you bump into ordinary citizens, how do you get beyond the ordinary story? I went out the other day to a little island off the coast of Rhode Island where there was a, a guy who is a 90-year-old uh, driver's license examiner. And the guy said, oh, that'd be great, you know, just be a funny little story about the little old guys. And we were doing a whole series about how people were extending their work while they retired. So I did. I went over there and I thought, okay, this is all I'm going to get. But I started using the, the things we've been talking about, fill the silence, and something more amazing happened. I'm, we, we've shot our story, but he, this guy's name, um, this guy's name was uh, Tom Bedford, and he was on this island for 82 years and never married. And I thought, hmm. And he was the only African American on this island for most of those 82 years. So I said, well, Tom, how, how did you get there? And he said, well, when I was eight years old, I was an orphan, and uh, a farmer by the name of Gerd Milliken brought me over as an indentured servant. And I said, well, why did you stay? Because I noticed you still live with the Milliken family in an unheated bedroom, they tell me, even though they've asked for years to get you down. And he said, well, when I was a young boy, all the farmers used to have parties on Saturday night and brag on their kids. And Gerd Milliken had eight boys and me. And he said one night Mr. Milliken got up and he pointed his finger down the end of the other end of the table and you said, he said, uh, you watch how Tom turns out. I think you'll be the best kid on the island. So I sat there and didn't jump in for a while. And he said, you know, I have been police chief I've been the fire chief. I've been the head of the rescue squad. I, uh, I was head of the Chamber of Commerce five times. And he said, uh, I won the Rhode Island State Lottery 10 years ago and got $5 million. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah. And uh, I threw a party on my birthday and announced that any kid that wanted to go to college, I'd pay for it. And he said, uh, I went to college at age 54. I didn't say anything. I just sat there. And of course, the camera crew, when they started this, were tearing things down. And they're listening. So now they're putting things back up. <laughs> you know, not a thousand lights, just one. And uh, so th this narrative continues to unfold. And I'm looking brilliant because I've said nothing. I'm just listening to him. And he says, yeah. Um, he said, I... You know, I, uh, I went back to school at age 54 because I realized that the island was changing from farming to tourism. And we're going to need some hotels. So I became the shop teacher. And the four principal builders on this island today all learned in Tom's class. Okay. So now the sun's setting. The ferry's leaving. <laughs> we're not on it. But we're letting him sit there and look. And he's looking out at the lighthouse and the pelicans 
And he's lost. I mean, he's like gone back 80 years in time. And uh, again, I said nothing. And he turned to me and towards the camera and he said, I hope he knows how I turned out. I went to do a, stony, a funny ha-ha story about a 90-year-old guy who is uh, giving driver's license to 16-year-olds. And this is the story we got. So we immediately thought, well, what's the closing shot? We haven't got it for this story. And I said, Tom, you getting a little tired? He said, yeah. He says, I generally go to bed around uh, 8 o'clock. And I said, do you mind if our camera is at the top as you climb the stairs up to your unheated bedroom? I didn't tell him that. And that's the closing shot. But because he was looking at the, uh, Block Island is well known for this beautiful old uh, lighthouse. And the more I got to thinking about it, the way I started to structure the story was, uh, you know, you're lucky if you've got one lighthouse. And this island's had two for almost a century. So that was my theme. And I started off predictably, you know, here's this funny guy with a 16-year-old trying to get into the car and double park, you know. And then started to move the layer. I mean, all good stories, whether they're a 10-second Twitter or an hour documentary or a book, is a lot like an onion. Not because it makes you cry, but it has a lot of layers to it. And it, they all should have layers because the audience is interested in different things. Some people probably stuck with me for two minutes because they just like the pretty pictures of Block Island. And some people got hooked up on the story but they were all there. And the best emails I get are, well, you made me late for my bus again today. I don't care what happens in the next five minutes on the Today Show, but in mine, I want to put them on my knee and tell them the story. But using some of those techniques, you see, you can rob enough time in your day to actually polish without having to sit there and angst over the first line. and What's my closing line and all that? Basically, you're looking for uh, some time to be able to put a little polish to it so it stands out from the person standing next to you. So, sometimes it's just um, as simple as not following the crowd. I covered a tornado once, and um, it was kind of a grade B tornado. It was like day three, and uh, nobody injured and a couple of mobile homes knocked over. And in, in the middle part of the country, that was pretty, you know, ho-hum. Except that the cameraman I was using was a terrific storyteller. So he found a guy who was looking for something. Now, what do, what do people look at, you know, after a tragedy on day three? They're looking for pictures because they already know their house is okay or not okay, and they've already taken care of the people that might have been hurt or not hurt. So this guy, we figured, was looking for, uh, for pictures. The rest of the journalists were all chasing the governor who had flown over and was going to provide some kind of uh, financial help. That was pretty obvious. So I figured I could cover that in copy. You know, they may or may not get financial help, the governor says. But instead, we used the man with the bib overalls as our thread because of one thing he did. He got comfortable enough with our camera as we followed him around that when he found what he was looking for, we got our last shot. He reached down into this pile of rubble and he pulled up this hunk of pink goo and he looked right at the camera and he says, well, it got my teeth, but it didn't get me. So the rest of the story, it was like a minute ten, you know, it had, it had the stuff, the name of the town and the, you know, but, but we had a little foreshadowing in there because stories really haven't changed since the first cave guy went down into the valley, killed a mastodon, and came back and started painting on the wall and saying, hey, this is what happened today. Nothing really changes. So, but what, what you try to do is to define the elements that get to the final shot. And in this case, we knew you're not going to be able to top, well, it got my teeth, but it didn't get me. You know? So we did foreshadowing. We introduced this guy at the front with a question. He's looking for something. I mean, what was it? We're not really sure what it is. And then every once in a while, while we were putting in the two or three other facts that we needed to get into the story, we'd see this guy poking around the corner. See? 
every good story has scene setter, where are we? Foreshadowing, something's going to happen. Conflict, no problem with that in journalism, everything's conflict. And resolution. Four girls in Kansas gave me a story that 50 years of journalists uh, had tried to pry out and could not. They were putting on a little history um, play in, in their club, and they wanted to uh, find out if there had any, been anybody like Otto Schindler who saved all the Jews and became Schindler's List, and Thomas Canale, the great Australian writer, wrote the story about Schindler's Ark. Well, there was a lady named Schindler, and she lived in Warsaw, Poland. And these girls wrote her a note because they found out that this woman had saved 2,500 Jewish kids from the Warsaw Ghetto. And she was five foot one inches tall. Well, all the journalists have been trying for years to get Mrs. Sendler to talk to them, and she wouldn't. But to the four girls in Kansas, this little tiny town of Kansas, she wrote 30 long letters. And this is what she did. The Nazis came to town, and they walled off about 500,000 people in an area the size of Hyde Park here in Sydney. And they didn't have enough to eat, and so they started dying at the rate of 5,000 a month. Mrs. Sendler was a uh, public service nurse. She goes to the Nazis and says, look, you know, you're not going to be able to keep the, the typhoid on that side of the wall, so you need me to go in there and try to settle that down so you guys don't get sick. And they bought it. She goes in. She starts talking to the young couples and saying, it doesn't look good. I'll tell you what, I'll find Catholic couples who really want to have children but can't. And if you give me your, your babies, I will give them to those couples who will be strong enough to keep them safe from the Nazis. And then in the meantime, I will write down their actual parents' names, put them in a glass jar, and bury them in my backyard across from the Gestapo headquarters which she did for four years. She got 2,500 kids out by carrying them in gunny sacks as she left. She'd sedate, sedate them a little bit. And the tiniest of she'd put them in bags. And she trained her dog to bark if the baby started crying. She made it for almost four years. And then she was betrayed by a Jewish mother who needed food. The Gestapo picked her up. They broke her arms, broke her legs, tried to find out where the jar was. She didn't tell them. But the underground bribed the Germans on the way out to sh shoot Mrs. Sendler. And instead, the driver threw her out of the car, and she saved another 500 kids. Never told the tale to anybody except for these four girls who ended up telling me. They eventually went over to Poland, and Mrs. Sendler was 97. And she was in an old folks home. And her nurse was one of the babies she'd carried out in a sack. And there were over 4,000 people who had, from that group of people, uh, descendants, because of what Mrs. Sendler had done. And so she had a question for the girls. We did this with home movies, by the way. We didn't go to Poland. We didn't have the budget. We put it together with home movies and you know, their little play. These girls were now in their late 20s, married, and they were still doing this play all over the country and sometimes all over the world. But Mrs. Sendler asked, why would you care? You live in Union, Kansas, population 200. You don't have a Jewish family for about 300 miles. The closest is Kansas City. Why would you care? And Jessica Ripper, one of the young women, said, uh, well, we, we don't care about race and religion in your story. What we care about is that good can overcome evil. So I thought about that as I was finishing writing the story. And I said, well, there's one other thing that seems to me that this is the so, so why should you care? Here was a group of women who were intent on rescuing the rescuer's story. Had it not been for these four girls, that would have died with Mrs. Sendler, who died the following year. Because of what these four girls did, Mrs. Sendler was nominated for a Nobel Prize, and she lost to Al Gore. So you, it, that's why it's important 
to go talk to ordinary people as if they were the governor. I'm not into doing good news. I don't really care about feature stories. What I care about is finding people who do significant things in their life and find solutions and blueprints for the rest of us and putting that on television. And as a practical matter, I think the only way we're going to survive in the next few years is on content. Because there's a ton of stuff out there. But if you have a story to tell consistently, which illuminates ordinary people, I mean, look at, look at the success of reality, so-called reality television. People love to see themselves, even if they can't dance, even if they can't sing. They want to be on TV. They want, to, they want their lives to be important. So why not find people who are truly important and tell their story? Now, the only thing that, um, the only piece of advice that I have to leave you with is this. Because I've been in more hotel rooms than the Bible, a few of them have left chocolates on the pillows. And one of them had a really good saying, which I kept in my wallet till it fell, fell apart, and now I have it, know it by heart. And I think it's, it's pretty much a mantra for journalists. And it said, success is not a question of being dealt a good hand. It's playing a bad hand well over and over and over again. Thank you all very much. If you have a question, I'll be glad to answer. Any questions for Paul? I have one. <laughs> Put them all to sleep. Look at that. Like, well, I've got one. <clears throat> when I went through journalism school, we were always taught that you kick off with your best shot, no matter what. So. When you ask the cameraman the question and say, what's your best picture, where do you put it? The best picture I always put at the end, if it's a, if it's a visual story. Uh, because I, and, and that's why the foreshadowing to that picture is important. It's not like you're going to start with a second best picture. But if you structure your story, even if it's a 10-second Twitter, in such a way that people feel like if they leave it right now, they're not going to see what, what you're going to deliver. Because otherwise, I mean, we've all seen stories which, you know, it telegraphs what the story's about. Goes with the best picture, the best opening line, and then spends the next 30 seconds or so talking about what they've already seen. Well, every, in this day and age, people have clicked away. But instead, if you say, the person held the knife up, and who's he going to stab? And then they're going to stick with you because they want to see who's he going to stab. But if you said, it's, you know, boom, the, the, the town blew up today, and you show the boom at that point... There's no drama. There's no, there's no storytelling to it. So you, you still need to foreshadow that something cool is going to happen, but you don't necessarily have to give it all away in your first shot. Any other questions for Bob? Yes, sir. The back there. Just, how do you resist the pressure of the people who are signed? You know, did you used to work in TV uh, features on the Today Show in Australia, in fact. How do you resist the pressure from people who assign you to stories that that's the story they want. You may well come back with what you think is a better one, but they've already put it down on a rundown. They've sold it down the line. It fits the kind of stereotypes that they want more. That's a good question. Um, well, the trick is to come back with a, a story that the audience will vindicate uh, the decision. And, and I always feel like if you're going to pitch a story that's more thoughtful or different or something that you think is, should be done, if you can't explain it to your boss in one sentence, you haven't thought it through yet. And I do, I, I, I get maybe 600 to 1,000 story ideas a month through various sources, and uh, I research about a dozen of those, and maybe two or three make it. So that's the, that's the unseen difficult part, but it's the same thing. Most people pitch you stories as topics. It's your job to move past it and to get the Block Island story or that, you know, you define that. And sometimes you do that on location, sometimes you don't. But uh, I've, I've, off, I've never no, had anybody who signs paychecks that if you come back with a story that works really, really good, that they, uh, you know, fault you for that. But the trick is you have to be hard on yourself at the beginning 
Okay, so maybe the story that they had came out of a newspaper and the elements aren't there for television, et cetera, et cetera. So you say, okay, the kernel is still there, which you've assigned, but look at this. This is so much more cool. This is it. And, and maybe you show them with other people in the room. <laughs> and so they go, oh, they're already hooked on it. But it's sort of like, I always try to tell a story in such a way that if the prime minister were listening, he'd be fascinated. But if the cook is listening, she's fascinated too. And to get to that point, you have to do, as, uh, as a writer, as much investigation as you would if you were doing an investigative report on the president. And that's where most of us lay down. We figure, okay, this is just going to be a fun piece, and so I can kind of be lazy with it. And it really isn't all that much fun. Most people, when they come to these kinds of stories, say, if I like sailboats, I'm going to do a story on a sailboat, and uh, it'll be cool, because I like sailboats. But I always approach every story as if the audience could care less. And then I try to find the emotional hooks that makes them care. Yes, sir. Uh, Roger Westcombe. Uh, the charm of the stories that you've told us this morning uh, depends to a considerable extent, I, I think, on the fact that during the telling of the story, you make us, as it were, fall in love with the subject. Uh, you show some essential nobility in them. Uh, how do you deal with really nasty people? Or, in fact, have you found that there are none? Oh, no. <laughs> but it's the, same si it's, a, it's the flip side of the same coin. Uh, nasty is actually easier because... Um, it, it's still an emotion. In the case of people that I've been telling you about, I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting, and they're ordinary people who you'd kind of like maybe emulate if you could. But in the case of someone who you hate, that's, that's simple too, because all you have to do is find the emotion and build the foreshadowing to that emotion. It's okay if somebody goes away feeling uh, terrible about this person or angry or frustrated. But it, the thing is, is that a lot of people say, well, you know, if, you, if I had talent, I could do this. Well, my message to you is talent's wonderful, but it's a craft and you can learn it. It really is. Hey, you, see, so, where am I? Where's my foreshadowing? You know, how do I hook these people? And if it's somebody who's terrible, you've got to give them some reason so that when they are terrible, I mean, you, you watch a really good movie and you see the villain and there's something about the way the uh, director or the actor interprets the villain that he gives them a human side. So he's so much more interesting than just a stick figure villain. Well, it's the same way in journalism. I and mean, most of the time we're dealing with people who've done something that's despicable. But you can still do the foreshadowing and say, you know, you think this is bad? Well, watch this. And so when, when this person comes on the scene, you know, immediately you've got their attention and, the, and you hang with it. Another question down the front here? Sure. Hi. Hi, I just wonder whether you noticed any dramatic changes in your audience over the years. I mean, you say the storytelling hasn't changed, but have your audience. I've noticed over the years that the trees are taller and the audience is younger. I, I no, I, you know, that's, it's interesting because the demographics of the people who, um, who watch my stories, 18 to 80. But I, I think it's because we are all wired for storytelling. You, you look at a lot of stuff on the internet today and you say, well, you don't see a reporter. Why would you need a reporter? Well, I contend that you need a reporter for the same reason you liked your mother telling you a story. You know, you trusted your mother, you loved the story, and you bonded with that person. And as professional journalists who expect to get a paycheck on Friday, wouldn't it be great to bond with your audience so that they don't care necessarily you know, what the story is about. They just like the way you tell it. And so their ears perk up when you, when you come on. And, and I, that's what I've tried to do. And I said, it, in essence, it's, it's because I start mentally with every story I do is absolutely uninteresting, even if it is interesting. And so I set the task to myself, where are my building blocks? It's really like architecture, you know, opening shot, the sound bite, the natural sound of, of, a, of a river going through. So I don't have to say that the river was high because I'm going to leave myself three seconds because you can see the river. When I was doing breaking news, I once went out and did a flood. It ran 55 seconds and a mother saw her baby 
in the flood. And the cameraman just followed a tear down his mother's face because when he went over looking for the baby, it was so far out in the flood you couldn't really see it. So he came back to the tear. I did the first 28 seconds of the 55 seconds following the tear. And that was my foreshadowing. You know, I had an establishing shot that there was this flood going on like everybody's been reporting all around the world. But where is this tear going? And what does this woman have to do with it? And then at that point, they finally rescued the baby. The baby comes in. It's a 55-second story, but it has a beginning, middle, and ending. It has drama. It has tension. It doesn't have an interview with the governor saying, you know, my gosh, it's the worst flood we've had in a thousand years. Everybody else is going to have that. So as professional storytellers, I look for the kinds of things that will hook the audience all along, no matter what I, whatever I do. And today, it's a whole lot simpler because if I do a story uh, for the Today Show, but I've done a gr great deal of research, I put it in my web column. So I'm like a farmer. I, know, I don't throw anything away. And it's terrific because we have about 9 million people who watch the Today Show in the morning in the United States. I had four stories last year that had between 48 million and 78, 2 million page views, which means that they had to watch a commercial to watch my spot. So when you go back to the people who sign paychecks and you say, I know you would like me to do 108 stories today, most of which would probably be forgettable, but if I could do one or two that people still talk about three years from now because it's on the electronic shelf, that's worth it too. So I think I'm more hopeful than I ever have of the younger generation coming along that there will be uh, an economic model for those people inclined to want to be storytellers. Not all of us want to be, but if you want to do a story like that, I think that you can make, make the case in the years coming down the line that there's, it's worth it financially for the company that hires you. I think, uh, Bob, we have to wind it up there. That's all we have time for today. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Bob Dodson. Thank you. I'm glad you're all still awake. <laughs> He's not, but the rest of you.